We go to a new system today. We have barely gone through the skeletal system to give you something to work with, and now we're going to put the muscles on it. Who knows what the term muscle means? Nobody? It is Latin, musculus. What does musculus sound like? Little mouse. Why are muscles called little mouse? If you had to guess, what might you say? Can I borrow you a minute? I was hoping s somebody was going to have short sleeves on. <laughs> and I caught him right here in the front row. <laughs> now, pull up your arm and show your biceps. <laughs> See? <laughs> Do you think <laughs> that little mouse running up and down the arm? <laughs> Who knows? But thank you. I didn't plant him. He just <laughs> happened to be there. Thank you very much. But at least you'll remember what it means now, won't you? <laughs> All right, let's look at functions of muscles. First, movement, obvious, for skeleton. Move skeleton. But also to provide control of such structures, such openings. Let's just put control of openings. And we can give examples there of the mouth and the anus. They both have skeletal muscle around them. Then we need to stabilize our joints. Stabilize our joints with our muscles. What does that allow you to do? Maintain your posture as you're sitting there. Otherwise, you just collapse. So we want to maintain posture. Then our muscles can produce heat. When you're cold, you run around, right? Get warm. with exercise. What else can muscles do for you? Just think of facial expression. You take one look at any one of you, and two seconds, you move a muscle, and one can get an idea what you're thinking, right? Facial expression. See whether you're sad, happy, fearful, and so forth. But it is amazing how rapidly you can change facial expression with just a thought or seeing somebody. You ever thought about what's involved every time? As I look at your, what are we doing? Switch microphones, all right.
sounds like it's working. Is that better? Or didn't you notice that the other one wasn't working? <laughs> so we were mentioning our functions here. And protection. In what way is it protecting? Protecting your eyes, for example. Quickly close them if something foreign is coming. Close your mouth if something foreign is coming. So close eyes and mouth. Anybody think of any other functions for muscles? Ever thought about your muscles except when they hurt? Well, what is nomenclature then? How do we name muscles? Well, first, we can name them by their shape. We can give an, the example of the deltoid. When we study the deltoid, we'll see that it has a base across here, comes to an apex down here, looks like an upside down Greek D. deltoid. We can tell them by the number of heads. We can have biceps, two heads. Triceps, three heads. Quadriceps, four heads. Does anybody have a muscle that has five heads? Do you know of any creatures in evolution that have five heads? We can tell muscles by the, the length. They can be short, brevis, or long, longus, so you can have a muscle in your forearm which is called, this will be an example, uh, extensor, carpus, radialis, longus. So you've had all those words now. So you can figure out where it is, what bones are involved, right? Is it going to be medial or lateral forearm? Lateral, sure, you've got radialis in there. So you begin to put things together rather than just memorize. That's what it is. All right, you can have location. We could have biceps brachii. Where are they going to be? Right, the one we just showed. Biceps brachii gives you the location of those biceps in the arm.
You can have biceps femoris. Did you know you had biceps in your thigh? You do. They'll be in the thigh. Have you ever known that? Ever thought about them? No? You can have intercostals. Where are intercostals? Where are they going to be? Between the ribs, right? Just very simple. But their location, the name designs it. Between ribs. Or a temporalis. Where is it going to be? Over your temporal bone, sure. Just giving you ideas that you can figure these out by their location, their names, integrate them. Very simple once you've got all your bones. They can be localized by attachments, where they're attached. What's a big one in your neck? Sterno. Clydomastoid, so you know exactly where it's going to be. Sterno, clydomastoid. Goes from sternum, clavicle. What does clavicle mean? It's a little key. To some people, the clavicle, I don't know what kind of keys they used in those days, but it's called a key. And then to your mastoid process, your temporal bone. So you can figure out immediately what it's going to do. You'll get its function once you know where it's attached. If that contracts, what's it going to do? When one contracts, one side of the head, both of them. That's why it's called a prayer muscle. But we'll get that when we go through later and define their, their functions for you. Now, we've had the functions of our bones. Well, obviously, the functions of the muscles are going to follow along the same. This is just a brief introduction before we get to the specific ones. So from functions from our muscles, We'll have flexors, extensors. What's the next one? Adductors, abductors, supinators, supinators, pronators. All of these different functions. What are supinators and pronators? We're going to see those with the hand. As the radius rotates, we turn the hand. When the hand is palm up, it's a supinator. Palm down, pronator. Supinator, palm up, pronator. Palm down. How do you remember that? Silly little thing. Bowl of soup. Palm up. Right? Ever been on a camping trip and had your soup in your hand? Hmm. You haven't really lived, have you? <laughs> <laughs> Lots more to think about. All right. We have what are called prime functions and antagonists. A prime mover and an antagonist.
the prime mover is the main muscle that's carrying out the function. The antagonist has to relax so the prime muscle or mover can function. So this relaxes. So, so example, you'll learn your biceps is helping flex, but it can only flex if the triceps relaxes. So the biceps are called prime movers. These are just terms that you see in the literature, so you'd be familiar when you run across them. So attachments to limbs. We need our basic terminology for attachments to limbs. We have origins and insertions. And yes, you learn those because when you know them, you can figure out the functions. So the origins in the limb will be at the proximal portion of the limb. Proximal. And the insertion then, distal. So you can figure them out. Say you have a brachioradialis. Usually the first part is the origin. So this will be at distal humerus brachial for the arm and distal radius here. And you say, my, they're both both distal. But this one is closer to the trunk, the one that's at the distal humerus, and it's going down to distal radius. This is the origin. This is the insertion. The origin is usually closer to the midline, but it's difficult to use the midline here, so we'll use the superior aspect of the limb. When we get to the chest muscles, insertion will be close to the midline, and insertion will be distal, all right? Not complex, it's just a matter of getting basic terminology. So with this now, let's start with the muscles of the head. And just take a few. How many muscles do you have in your body? If we took them all, how many would we have to take? 638. Is that the correct number? What's the correct number? As of today's world, it's 639. In 1996, they found a new muscle in the human skull. It's only an inch and a half long. It's posterior to the orbit, and it goes down to the mandible. Nobody knows what it does. <laughs> but it shows that anatomy is not dead. They can still find things that have never been found or never looked for. So 639. OK, and we're going to do muscles of head. And the first one we're going to take is the occipital frontalis. 
and you know immediately where it's going to be, right? So if we take a skull and we put in our occipital, and our frontalis, we have something like this. Now, what's between the two? There's a thin, tough layer of connective tissue. comes across forming a helmet over your skull here. And this is called the galea, which means helmet, aponeuroptica, galea, aponeurotica. What in the world is an aponeurosis? You're going to see these round muscles, thin, tough layers of connective tissue. So this is a helmet, galea. It's a thin, tough, or strong, whatever word you want, connective tissue that connects the occipitalis with the frontalis. So for the occipital component, the origin is the occipital bone and our little mastoid process. And it's going to insert, I'm just going to abbreviate it into the gala aponeurotica, as you can see here. It's going to insert there. It originated here. Insert at the gala aponeurotica. Now comes the question, what's its function? Can anybody here contract your occipitalis? No, we had a student, and he'd come up and show us. Usually we have one. Nobody can do it. Can you even try to even think about it? Have you ever known it was there? He could, and his whole back of his hair would go up and down when he was contract. You doing it? No, you're doing, you're doing your frontalis beautifully. All of us can do frontalis. <laughs> That's fine. But you've got one muscle there that just been going freeloading. So we've got frontalis. Origin will be the gala aponeurosis, as we have its origin here. And its insertion will be in muscles in the superior orbit. We've got the orbit here. So in superior orbit, this will be insertion, just to keep it here. I'll take it up high will be the muscles in superior orbit. And partially, it will be the orbicularis oculi. Example, orbicularis oculi. So you can see that the, this frontalis has no bony attachment. No bony attachment. Now, who can figure out what its function is? What's the function of your frontalis? 
Look at the person sitting next to you. Ask them to contract their frontalis. So action, raise your eyebrows and wrinkle your forehead, right? Very important to know. You may not think so, but it is. Raise eyebrows and wrinkle forehead. Now, is there anybody who can't do this? Look at your neighbor. Can he do it? She? Everybody can do it? Then you have healthy seventh nerves. Your seventh cranial nerve innervates this muscle. So it's very important clinically that we begin to learn the nerves that are going to be coming to some of our muscles to begin with. So the seventh nerve innervates. So when you come for a clinical neurological examination, the easiest thing for them to say is just wrinkle your forehead and raise your eyebrows. They know your seventh nerve is working, this motor component at least. So let's go on now and take some muscles in the orbit. Let's um, take the levator. This will be in orbit. Levator palpebrae. So you can tell right away, what does it do? What's palpebrae? Eyelid. What's it doing to the eyelid? It's raising it, right? So this raises eyelid. Its origin will be the superior aspect of the orbit, superior orbit, and it's going to insert in the upper eyelid. Origin, superior orbit, insert, upper eyelid, and its action. What's it called? <laughs> Levator. Raises the eyelid. Repeat, repeat, repeat. So a person comes into your office and has a droopy eyelid. What nerve are you going to say is out? No, good guess. <laughs> Third. Third nerve for the eyelid here. We're only going to take a few of these this time. When we get to the nervous system, we'll take more. But third nerve innervates your levator palpebrae eye muscle. Now, how are we going to close our eye? We've got it open. But there's a lot you can learn from just looking at somebody. Pretty soon when we get all your cranial nerves, you'll do it with each other. You'll test every one of them and be sure that they're all functioning. Very simply. So let's now take the orbicularis oculi. This one's going to close the eyelid. So we'll have it originate. Get some new terms here. Here's our orbit. And here, this is medial. This is lateral. We'll have our medial palpebrae ligament. Medial. palpebrae ligament. And laterally, we'll have the lateral palpebrae ligament. So this muscle will originate 
at the medial palpebrae ligament. And we'll insert at the lateral. And its action will be to close the eye. So we can see its muscular arrangement coming around in the lid like this. And when these muscles contract, then the eyelids close. But it's fascinating of the two controls on this factor. It's capable, capable of a blink. Very fast. Just blink. To do the blinking as fast, it's just this muscle, this way. But when you squeeze your eyelids to protect them, or you're swimming, you don't have your glasses, you want to squeeze, then you use the whole muscle. You don't just blink. But isn't it amazing how fast that blink is? And to think of muscles contracting, you think it's faster than a hummingbird's wing? You don't think so? <laughs> OK, I just think it's amazing that you've got that muscle with its double innervation, and one of them just like that, and the other one's slow and sustained and can keep it. Beautiful design just in your eye. So that gives us the um, muscles for the eye. Let's see, which one do we want to take next? We have lots of these muscles today, if we can get them all in. Let's take a cheek muscle. Let's just move down to the mouth. So we'll take a cheek muscle. Take the buccinator. Have you heard of your buccinator? What does buccinator mean? Trumpet. Does anybody play a trumpet? Yes. You know you buccinator then, do you? Sure. Cheek muscle really contracts to get the air directed to go out through your mouth, right? So it means trumpet. So it will be originating from the maxilla and mandible. So we'll have it if mouth is here. It's coming in from maxilla, mandible, and it's coming in to the angle of the mouth. It will insert at the angle of the mouth. So you have the same coming from the opposite side. angle here to insert in. So function or action, well, you can see easily that if it's going to pull, it can help you smile. It can pull out the corners of your mouth. But it can also compress the sides of the cheek, compress cheek to force air out mouth. And that's where it gets its name, trumpet. Squeeze it. It's useful for when you're chewing, and you chew down, and the food goes laterally. Buccinator can contract and push it back in between the teeth. In chewing. keeps food between teeth.
between teeth crowns, let's say. We don't want it aside. All right? So that's a buccinator. Now let's get the, the next one will be, which one do we want to take? The orbicularis oris, orbicularis oris. Orbicularis. So you can tell where it's going to be. This will be around the mouth. It's going to close the mouth. And again, the origin will be cheek muscles. See, I'm not giving you all the cheek muscles. Cheek muscles, including the buccinator. No, when I meet my former students over at UCSF and they say, we thought we were getting a lot here, we didn't realize how much there is to get, and they're getting it over there. This is just the beginning. Insertion here will be the contralateral. We'll define it in a moment. Contralateral. Angle of mouth. Think of its function. See why it's got to go to the opposite side. So if I have a mouth here, and I have my muscle over here coming in from cheek muscles, it's going to insert clear over on the opposite angle. Come all the way around. We'll do this. And same here all the way over here to insert. And then you've got it coming from the other side. And that's got to go around and insert here. That's contralateral, opposite side. So obviously, when it contracts, it's going to close the mouth. Now, what closes the jaw? You have two muscles to close the jaw. So you know what your jaw bones are, so you know where to expect it. Muscles, jaw, we have two. One is the temporalis, temporalis. And one is the masseter. Masseter. Masseter means chewer. Temporalis, you know. So we're going to have, here's our jawbone. We've got to make use of its attachment. So we're going to have the temporalis originates on the squamous portion of the temporal bone and inserts on the coronoid process of the mandible. Makes sense. It's got to come to the mandible. And this is available for an attachment. So origin for temporalis. Equals squamous portion of temporal bone. This is temporalis. And insertion will be the coronoid process of mandible. And what's it going to do when it contracts? Just what this little spring does. Contracts, closes jaw.
but it has some support. How much pressure do you think you can exert when you, I mean, you put your pencil in there. If it's wooden, you'll just crunch it right in half. Have you ever tried that? No, because I look at your pens and they're all plastic. So I recommend you don't try it. But how much pressure do you think you can exert with these two muscles crunching down? Somebody has said it's about 200 pounds. That's a lot. Remember the boxer who bit off the other boxer's ear? <laughs> Gives you an idea of the 200 pounds of pressure taking that off, right? Powerful muscles. So what's your other one, the masseter? And the masseter originates then. See, we've got to use our bones. We develop them. Your zygomatic arch here, made of these three bones, commonly called the cheekbones. Very fashionable to have high cheekbones. So originates on, as you knew it before, cheekbone. It's now our zygomatic arch. And it's got to close the jaw, give all that pressure, so it's going to insert on the angle and the ramus of the mandible. Remember the ramus? Remember the angle? So it's just coming down, a little almost square coming down, to insert on ramus and angle of mandible. And its function then is to close the jaw with great force. You know why I feel inspired to teach you anatomy today? I got an email from a friend who was in a Southeast Asian country. I won't name names. I'll just give the status of it. And he was told that he had torn his Achilles tendon from his calcaneus, and it needed to be sewn back up. So he knew he didn't want to stay there and have it done, so he went someplace else to have it done. And they said, what you really have is an infected blister. You think you could identify the calcaneus and the Achilles tendon versus an infected blister? I hope so, but it sure inspires me to give you basic honest-to-goodness anatomy. Imagine if he didn't have any question and had gone through and had his Achilles tendon operated on. Dear me. Anyhow, I thought that's a good story to tell you, to inspire you to want to learn your anatomy well. Where are we? We're finishing with our lower jaw. Now, let's look at some muscles. These are big muscles that are attaching the upper extremity to the trunk. Muscles, I'm just putting large ones because there's so many small. Large muscles attaching upper extremity to trunk. We're going to take, whoops, two posterior and one anterior. Let's just quickly give you the superior posterior. And the name of this one will be the trapezius. Trapezius because it has a trapezoid shape. So let's just quickly see how it would have a trapezoid shape, see if, how far we get. But I don't want to get too far behind here. Every time I tell a story, I lose some time. So here we have the occiput. Here we have the vertebral column. And we have the cervical vertebra and the thoracic vertebra. And we'll have the spine of the scapula. Spine of scapula. Now, 
and what will have the origin will come from the occiput and from what's called the ligamentum nuci. What in the world's the ligamentum nuci? Lig, uh, L-I-G, ligamentum, what? Lig, ligamentum nuci. I'll give a definition of it, and then we'll stop and give our slides and continue. It's a ligament that attaches all the spines of the cervical and thoracic vertebrae. It runs down ligamentum nuci, connecting all the spines of thoracic and cervical vertebra. Let's show slides then, and we'll continue with this. And don't forget 131A right after, because we start in 10 minutes past 12. Hmm. I don't see a pointer here this morning either. Where is it? <laughs> There's one. Okay, thanks, Amelia. Thank you. Yeah, we're fine. All right, here's your frontalis muscle. And you've had the gala aponeurosis. You see a little of it coming here, but it's originating from the gala aponeurosis. And then we'll be inserting in the muscles in the superior aspect here. So when you contract the muscle, you raise your eyebrows and wrinkle your forehead. Here's your obicularis oculi. You can see the fine muscles of it that will make the eyelid move very fast for a blink. And then when you scrunch it hard, these will come into play. Here's your obicularis oris. Your buccinator will be coming in from the side to the angle of the mouth. In the next one, here's your sternocleidomastoid, here's your sternum, here's your clavicle or clido, here are the two heads, here's the sterno, the clido coming together to insert on the mastoid process. I use this picture to show you a little occipitalis up here, and then it's gala aponeurosis, which will continue over and then become the frontalis here. Here you can see a little bit more of buccinator. No one picture shows everything. Here's your deltoid. The base of it here coming down at apex will be on the humerus down here. And the base is both on the lateral uh, clavicle and lateral spine of the scapulae on the other side. In the next one, and this, oh, we didn't get to the pectoralis major, but we will next time. But here's the deltoid, which we did mention. All right, we'll get to all of this soon. All right? We have one more minute. Do we have one more slide? Yeah. This is showing the trapezius coming here. It's originating up here at the occiput, coming over to insert on the spine of the scapulae. And it has coming up from the thoracic spines, the ligamentum nuchae, coming in this direction. So you're going to be forming a trapezoid when you get both sides. Here's the deltoid. And we'll continue with this next time. Have a lovely weekend.